Hi, and welcome to the Faith Matters Podcast. This is Aubrey Chavez. We hope everybody is staying healthy and safe. We know that there's a lot of concern and worry right now, and we're really hoping that by releasing more content, we can help lift spirits in our own small way. We're really excited about this episode. We talked with Stephen C. Harper, professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University, and author of the new book, First Vision, Memory, and Mormon Origins. Steve has also served as the managing historian and general editor of Saints, and as a volume editor of the Joseph Smith Papers. President Nelson declared 2020 a bicentennial year to commemorate Joseph Smith's first vision and invited us to study the first vision in advance of General Conference. There's no one better to talk with about this subject than Steve. Reading this book completely changed our perspective on the first vision itself, and he explains why it was never a given that the first vision would become the seminal story of our faith. We'll link to the book from our website, but you can also head to Amazon or Desert Books website to buy it. We'd encourage everybody that has a chance to read it. Again, the book's called First Vision, Memory, and Mormon Origins. This was an absolutely fascinating conversation, and we think everybody that listens will learn something new. Okay, well, Steve, thank you so much for for coming on. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you. Um, We feel like this is very, very timely with the the bicentennial of the First Vision uh, coming up and our celebration of it, and you being uh, one of the leading scholars on this on this uh, subject. So thank you so much for for being here. You bet. I'm very glad for the invitation. Thank you both. Of course. Sure. Um, we'd love to we'd love to start before we dive into the subject matter specifically. If you wouldn't mind giving sort of your your background personally, your mm-hmm. uh, your faith journey, your um, your education, and kind of what brought you to the point you're at yeah. now, if that's okay. I am a sort of an unlikely historian, I guess you might say. I didn't even know people were historians when I was a teenager. <laughs> uh, I thought my job prospects were, I'd like to be an NFL quarterback and maybe <laughs> something that makes enormous amounts of money. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that was about my horizon. Yeah. And I uh, realized now that I was quite interested in history, but I wouldn't have been able to perceive it as a teenager, mm. but I had a really, really formative experience in 1985 where I became aware the, of Mark Hoffman's forgeries, you know, with along with just about everybody else, not knowing they were forgeries at the time, right? right? So it's sort of jarring. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to overstate it. I was not particularly precocious, but a letter purportedly from Joseph Smith to Josiah Stoll about how to find the right kind of hazel branch and cut mm-hmm. it the right way to find buried treasure was published in the church news in May of 85. Yeah. Oh. And I remember reading it and being a little um, disoriented by it. Never heard that in church. Mm-hmm. Asked my dad about it. What's this all about? He said something like, you know, I don't know. He had just read it before me. I've never heard that either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he said, you know, things like this come up from time to time. And if you will keep your faith and um, keep studying, you know, keep asking this question, what, what's this all about? Mm-hmm. He said, you'll, you'll be okay if you'll just be steady. Don't overreact. Don't run away from what you already know because you don't mm-hmm. know this. I didn't realize at the time how fundamental, how, how foundational that experience was to me. That fall, um, Hoffman killed two innocent people and his scheme unraveled. And yeah. my dad proved more and more over time to be really prophetic yeah. and really steady. And I learned from that experience that I could expect things that I didn't understand or know about to complicate what mm. I knew. Uh, that was a given. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I could expect that if I stuck with the things I did know and kept looking into the things I didn't, then uh, I'd get more information and pieces of the puzzle would fit together better. And so from a young age, I had that experience that Bruce and Marie Hafen are calling simplicity to complexity to other side simplicity. Mm. And not everybody gets it that young. Yeah. And it can be really disorienting, as you know, and um, it can be completely, completely unmoor you from from your faith. Yeah. So um, that was the beginning for me. And at the time, I did not even know it. I had no idea. I, I took a lot of other experiences, and um, a mission was really good for me to learn 
that I was very, very interested in the restored gospel, Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. I could study for a lifetime and not exhaust. Where did you serve a mission? I went to Central Canada to the Winnipeg Mission, which was perfect for me. Yeah. I confess I was disappointed when I read the, <laughs> my parents actually read the letter to me over the phone and I was like, oh, great. Uh, isn't everybody Aww. in Canada already a Latter-day Saint? And it turns out they're not yeah. actually. And I didn't, I didn't help much. With that. <laughs> but it was a great experience for me and came back home determined to love the scriptures and learn everything about them and found out that was more complicated than I thought and migrated sort of away from the Bible to Joseph Smith's revelations. Mm -hmm. They're just complicated enough and dense enough and uh, to to be a fun challenge, right? To spend a lifetime, but not so complicated that you throw your hands up in the air and say, I can't know anything about this. Right. And I admire the Bible scholars who, who do that work, but I, I gave up on that. I threw my hands up in there. It was a famous book you might know, Who Wrote the Bible? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I st- I've read the book, and I still don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> so it's too too complicated for me, Bible yeah. studies. But um, church history, Joseph Smith's Revelation texts, which I know pretty much who wrote them and where they came from, is yeah. just, just meaty enough uh, and close enough in proximity to us and yet far enough away to still be that foreign country. The past is yeah. a foreign country. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it was the right fit to focus on early church history. Yeah, that's so interesting. So <clears throat> this book that you just that you just wrote, First Vision, um, Memory and Mormon Origin, mm-hmm. um, you say at the beginning that the goal is not to to persuade someone whether or not the, the vision happened, but really it's kind of an exploration of memory and how memory works. Right. So would you would you start for someone who hasn't read the book and, and start with memory and explain um, how this idea that it's more of a process mm-hmm. as opposed to a stored artifact that in, in the way that a lot of us probably have always thought of memory? Right. It's a very important point. Uh, by default, it seems like uh, as humans, we think of memory the way we might think of a file cabinet or, yes. or a DVD or, uh-huh. you know, it's something that's stored intact. And whenever we want to replay it, we just <laughs> get it out of the file or we put it in yeah. the player and there it is. And it's the same memory. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that nobody, no scholars of memory no scientists or psychologists who've made this their life's work think about memory that way. Mm. There's no good reason to think about it that way. Yeah. Uh, memories, autobi- we're talking here mainly about what we could call autobiographical memory. So I'm going to remember my past. I just did this, right, for you guys. Yeah, I, yeah. Just, I just made a memory in real time. I didn't yes. go back into a file cabinet and pull that out. I made it up as I went. And it was made out of what Professor Schachter at Harvard, maybe the foremost psychologist of memory, what he calls Mm -hmm. traces. Nobody knows what they are, exactly where they are, right? We talk about them as if they're in our mind somewhere. And that works, I guess. But traces or these pieces of the past. And um, in, in real time, I gathered up those traces and made a memory. And it was particularly for this setting right here, right now. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've told that story lots of times, but I told it to you differently. Um, not exactly sure what all the differences are, right? I've yeah. forgotten and remembered in new ways. So a memory of my past or of Joseph Smith's past is a present production. He made his memories of his first vision in the moment in the that present. he wrote them down mm-hmm. or told them. And he made them out of traces of the past, but also out of what was going on right in the present or what his circumstances were. His mood at the time, his environment at the time, shaped the way he remembered his first vision over time. And it's really valuable to think about the first vision accounts that way. Um, Dan Vogel has asked, "How, how certain can we be that he tells us the experience as he had it at the time Mm -hmm. it's a good question but it's it's not the best question in my judgment um the best question or the one we can really get at is what do the accounts tell us about how he experienced the vision over time yeah Yeah. right because we have one from 1832 and a 35 38 42 we can get at 
how does he experience this vision as his life goes by? How does he interpret yeah. it? Yeah. And um, present it over time. Right. Yeah. And the changes that inevitably mm-hmm. occur are not conscious changes, you're arguing. Right? I don't think so. I think there's not great evidence that he's consciously manipulating his story. Yeah. Uh, or that he's putting a whole lot of forethought into how will I tell it. We've, we've started to almost default in saying, well, he told this story to different audiences at different times. That's true. Yeah. But it implies a kind of, you know, today I'm going to tell Robert Matthews the story in a different way than I wrote it with Frederick Williams three years ago. I don't think he's putting that kind of thought into it. Yeah. yeah. I do think he's putting a lot of thought into it. But, uh, for example, let's take those two memories I just mentioned, the 1832 autobiography in his letter book yeah. mm-hmm. and the 1835 spontaneous telling to Robert Matthews, which gets recorded in his journal. Those are two completely different kinds of brain work for Joseph. Mm. When he sits down to do the autobiography, it's a stressful situation. He's not good at writing. Mm -hmm. He feels pressured to do it because there's no record of the first vision. The Lord has told him repeatedly, you've got to keep this record. Mm -hmm. He's got Book of Mormon manuscripts. He's got his Revelation manuscripts, but no record of his first revelation. And unless he gets it down... It's going to evaporate. Mm -hmm. So he knows he has to do it, and he knows he's not going to be good at doing it, and it's a labor. Mm -hmm. For him to compose autobiography is hard brain work for him. And I don't think he's satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. We love that account, typically, but he... He didn't show it to anybody as far as we can yeah. tell. Yeah. Interesting. So the, one of the things that I've heard about memory is that it b- can become more distorted the more that you retell it. Mm-hmm. Then in your terminology, those those traces, as they reconstruct a memory, um, can uh, become more more imperfect with each, with uh-huh. each retelling. So uh, like I guess as an example, if I were to retell something for the first time a year after it happened i've only i've i haven't had a chance to reconstruct yet and so that first reconstruction may stay fairly true to the um to the original memory but the more i've actually reconstructed it the more chance there is for distortions to come in is that in in your in your opinion is that an accurate view of memory well i'd say in some ways it is so it's it's the case that autobiographical memories are distorted yeah Mm. everybody who studies it carefully agrees with that but uh, some of the things we've Mm. assumed about memory and distortion are not accurate so for example i can't remember what i had for breakfast yesterday morning right (laughs) i can remember that experience i told you about when i was 14 pretty vividly though yeah i remember where i was sitting i remember what i was reading i don't remember what i was wearing i don't remember I remember that my father was seated on on this side of me. I was to his left. He was to my right. In other words, there are some things I remember very clearly. And then most of it, I don't recall. That's because the things that matter most, the parts that I replay over in my head Mm -hmm. every day, uh, the parts that are connected with emotional responses, those parts get encoded in my memory. Mm -hmm. And they tend to not diminish over time. I can live to be 100. And my memory wow. of that's, you know, barring anything terrible happening, yeah. Yeah. my memory will be good on that. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's not distorted. Yes. Um, if I could somehow, if I, somebody had videotaped that event and I watched it now and I compared it to the story I just told you, there'd probably be some yeah. distortions in it. Yeah. That's probably true of Joseph's vision as well. But notice that historians pretend pretend that memory is like radioactive decay, right? You can, you can predict exactly mm-hmm. how fast your rate of decay is, and, and that's yeah. just like memory, right? There's this kind of exact formula for predicting how memories are going to decay over time. That is right. not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's nonsense. It is Professor Schachter and others have found that some memories actually consolidate stronger over time. He has a theory of that. Uh, Thomas D'Anastasio and others as well have theorized that that memory recruits different parts of our brain. Yeah. And uh, we might have different traces of, of things stored all over the place. And it might take time, actually, for those 
things kind of conglomerate together and form into a memory. Nobody knows, frankly, for sure why, wow. but we do know that it's not the case that a mem- an autobiographical memory will decay at some kind of predictable yeah. rate over time. That's not true. Yeah. Yeah. And we also know that, um, you know, just because, I, I, again, I can remember some things that happened years ago much more vividly than I can mm-hmm. remember something that happened yesterday. Yeah. yeah. It has a lot more to do with how deeply it was embedded in me at the time mm-hmm. yeah. and how much I rehearsed it. Joseph Smith rehearsed his vision a yeah. lot. And it was deeply, deeply embedded in him. Notice, for example, how deep the experience with James 1 and 5 was encoded in him. Mm. I mean, that, he will never, for, he could live to be 100. He's mm. never going to forget the day that he realized that the Bible didn't have to be read as an archive of all the answers. Yeah. It could actually point him to seek his own answers. That was an epiphany that he would not ever forget. And do you yeah. say that because it, mm-hmm. that James 1, 5 it appears in virtually so every account? So yeah. vividly. Yeah. Not just that it's there, but it is emotional. It's yeah. laden with meaning yeah. and import. Uh, that tells us that he deeply internalized it. It's a memory that's not going to go away. Yeah. And there are other things. He can't seem to remember how old he was. Yeah. Right? I was about 14, one account says. I was in my 15th year. Frederick Williams inserts in the 16th, in the 16th year of my year. age. Yeah. He doesn't know how old he was. Yeah. Thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, Willard Richards writes in. Yeah. Uh, so the, the age, the exact day, those yeah. are the details that have sort of dropped out of the bottom. Yeah. And he can't recall. But there are some things that he can vividly recall. And he always will yeah. be able to. I like that image that I, I think you mentioned something about a leaky bucket. It's like one leaky mm-hmm. bucket being poured into another leaky bucket and you lose those little details like what you were eating you for breakfast that morning. And But the meat of the experience is what sticks with you forever. Right. Um, you said the word consolidation. Will you just will you talk about what that means <laughs> and, and this idea that like memory has a culture in the moment and... Yeah, memory scholars use that term consolidation to describe how memories form. How does an autobiographical memory form? Mm-hmm. So it's it's the process, and it is a process. It's not an event. Memory yeah. is a process, and a memory consolidates, and it sometimes takes time for it to do so. And then it's constantly reforming. Mm-hmm. It never stays static. Now, um, some memories, though, like the kind that get into the less leaky bucket. Yeah. If we if we, if we think of a memory, uh, you know, as an event that happens and it gets it's water that we pour into a really leaky bucket. Yeah. And then we take that leaky bucket and we pour it into a little less leaky bucket. This is the analogy that again Thomas Anastasio and others uh, of his colleagues have used. Yeah. That less leaky bucket is like Joseph Smith's memory of his vision accounts. It's not going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not going to retain everything, but it's going to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. The, meta, the, the memories, therefore, are not static. They're going to change over time, but they are stable, yeah. stable yeah. memories. Now, the bucket analogy, is that what colloquially we would people like us would refer to as short-term memory and long-term memory? Not exactly. Okay. Not exactly the same, but generally speaking, that will work. Okay. That, that, that's... Yeah, you can you form that first memory in a matter of seconds or minutes, and it yeah. has a lot more to do with neurons and so forth. That other one, the long term one, has a lot more to do with conscious choices about replaying the memory, yeah. re, uh, you know, re- uh, bringing it up again in our mm-hmm. minds, replaying it, rehearsing it. Yeah. yeah, and that's those are the reinforcing things that turn it into a consolidated memory that's going to be stable. Yeah. over a long time, over a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm really curious. I mean, you brought up the fact that you believe that the first vision, uh, all aspects of it, James 1, 5 in particular, were heavily encoded in Joseph Smith's, um, in his memory, mm-hmm. because we see, because he talked about them so much. Uh, to some, that may be, at least the way I see it or the way I read it in the book, that may be a controversial point. I mean, one sure. of the primary uh, criticisms has been that you know, supposedly this thing happened between sometime between 1820 and 1824, mm-hmm. let's say. But uh, obviously there isn't an account until several, several years later. Right. So could you get maybe into the current scholarship on what we know about when Joseph Smith really started talking about this? Who were the first people to hear? And sure. what happened in sort of the 
you know, that 10 to 15 year time frame before it started to enter the, the consciousness of, yeah. of the church? This is a great question. Um, some really talented scholars are at work on this question right now. I'm thinking primarily of Ann Taves. Um, and so let's start with what the historical record says, mm-hmm. right? The, the evidence we have to work with says in 1832, Joseph speaking, I could find no one who would believe the heavenly vision. Mm. I pondered it in my heart, but I couldn't find anyone else who believed. The 1838 account says some few days after I was in company with a Methodist minister who was influential. I told him the account of the vision. He responded with contempt. He said, Mm. it's all the devil. I was greatly surprised at his uh, response. So those are the only two pieces of evidence we have for who Joseph tells and when he tells. Mm. So depending on whether we trust him or not, whether his memory is reliable or not, it sounds like he tells a Methodist minister a few days after. That could have been as far as July after if that minister is George Lane. Mm -hmm. We don't know that it is. We don't know that it isn't. Um, But he gets rejected. I believe that happened. I believe that's a historical event. The memory of it is vivid. Mm -hmm. I don't think he made that up. Fawn Brody said his first vision was a half-remembered dream. Boy, the memories of it are not characteristic of a half-remembered dream at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think he does interview with that minister, and he is shocked at the response. I think he most likely assumes that he's a Methodist convert or something like that. He's he's finally had an experience like other yeah. people have had. And he's happy, you know, that finally, after all this time, struggling with his sinfulness and seeking forgiveness through Christ yeah. and not being able to find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are all well documented in the accounts. Finally, he's found it. So I think he tells that minister in anticipation of being validated. This is mm-hmm. a common thing to do. To have a conversion experience. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then to yeah. tell your minister about it yeah. and sort of sort of have it adjudicated by the minister. Yeah. And you expect the Methodist minister is going to say, great, I told you that would work. Yeah. Um, and he's shocked, Joseph is, yeah. when it doesn't work out that way. So all we know is that the historical record says he tells that minister and he could find no one who would believe. Mm-hmm. Now, some people are going to say, uh-uh, he told his mom. Well... All we know is that in 1842, four years after the original memory was consolidated, Mm -hmm. Willard Richards added an amendment to it, and maybe at Joseph's behest, nobody knows exactly because it's in Willard Richards' handwriting, and Willard adds in that chunk about Joseph leaning up against the fireplace and mom saying, are you okay? (laughs) I'm okay, mom. I just learned for myself Presbyterian isn't true. Well, he apparently doesn't tell her the story of the vision. Yeah. Uh, if he does, apparently she doesn't believe yeah. because yeah. he says, I could find no one who would believe. So the question then becomes, and James Allen is really the scholar who first asked this question, who does he tell and when does he tell them? And so I've laid the groundwork of that. And the next thing we can say is uh, James Allen's research showed he didn't tell hardly anybody else for a long time, maybe well into the 1830s when he started to uh, to dictate accounts of it in, into the 1840s before he published it. But we now know, based on some more recent research, that at about the same time he wrote his 1832 autobiography, which he doesn't seem to have shared. He seems mm-hmm. to have suppressed it. And Oliver Cowdery starts talking about early church history in the newspaper, the church's newspaper, and misses. He, he totally conflates Joseph's first and second vision. About that time, Joseph starts telling, orally, telling his first vision. We have quite a bit of evidence of this. It's come to light just in the last decade. And it's really quite revealing. Mm -hmm. This is the way I interpret it. I believe that Joseph finds it very hard to write the vision. I believe he finds it easier to tell the vision. Mm -hmm. And in those oral tellings, he's pretty free. Compare the 1835 account to the 32 and notice the pace. The pace is fast. It's a vivid uh, story. It's not that halt to, you know, those sentences that are yeah. labored mm-hmm. and freighted with, you know, misplaced modifiers and stuff. It's just Joseph dumping it out, which yeah. he, is relatively easy. He seems to do that pretty commonly. The, the, the 1835 account to Robert Matthews turns out to be one of many of these. It just so happened it got recorded. Mm-hmm. 
But there were a lot of those tellings throughout the mid-1830s. And I believe they gave Joseph confidence, telling it to believers, having it be well-received. William Phelps is telling him, Joseph, preach again on, this is my beloved son, hear him. Mm -hmm. So it's just being gobbled up. Parley Pratt says he tells it in the Kirtland Temple, and there's standing room only. And uh, just the saints just love it. Yeah. Mary Isabella Horn says he tells it in Canada, and she can't get enough of it. Mm. So we know a lot more now than we used mm-hmm. to about how and when he's telling the story. Yeah. And it's earlier than we thought. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about the 3839 version? Because I thought that was a really interesting way to understand consolidation and how the, his context had really changed. And so parts of the vision that maybe weren't as meaningful before seemed like all he was thinking about in yes. that version. Yeah, I'll follow Richard Bushman's lead on this. Richard is uh, my favorite interpreter of of the vision accounts. And he's the one who says, you know, that 1832 account is a pretty personalized, uh, that's the that's the conversion story of an evangelical convert mm. to Christ, an individual who's been saved by Jesus after praying in the woods. Mm. And that 1838 account is different from that. It is, that's the account of the president of a new church. Yeah. Yep. Uh, saying the whole question was about which church is right. And it turned out none of them were. Their creeds were an abomination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so here is the church, right? Yeah. That's the founding story of the church of Jesus Christ. Whereas 1832 account is, is not that. It's really not the concern mm-hmm. uh, at the center of it. So why would we get that over time? One reason is because the church has grown up in the interim. Yeah. And another reason is because Joseph is pretty embattled in that 1838 account. Yeah. He started it uh, in 1838 before he's exiled from Missouri, before he's jailed in Liberty, before the saints are driven out by the extermination order, and he finishes it on the other side of the Mississippi River. So the worst year of his life is the meat yeah. of the sandwich yeah. between those yeah. drafts. And you can tell that there's something that's making him pretty uptight From the first line, owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing people. I have been induced to write this history. I don't want to, (laughs) but you've made me do it. I'll tell you the facts so far as I have them in my possession. And then notice that he calls the Protestant clergy priests three times in a row. Yeah, I love that. That's a... He knows that that's a... He knows that the people who are liked about as much as him are Catholics in his time and place. And he knows that calling Methodists priests will be a little bit of a a dig. (laughs) He knows that. And so it's a, it's an anti-clerical piece, right? The Protestant Mm -hmm. clergy are the, the root of the problem in that telling of the story. And he pulls no punches, right? And this one, the savior says, all their professors are corrupt. All their creeds are an abomination. Yeah. And this one, of course, um, you know, has a, a powerful place in our uh, collective memory of the vision. Yeah. This is the one that gets selected and yeah. related, to use the technical terms. Yeah, yeah. And it has a dominant influence over our our sort of persecution complex, our yes. inheritance of being embattled mm-hmm. against the rest of the Christian world. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious yeah. how much distortion you i guess believe is is possible while still retaining honesty right so like i like when we're saying 1838 um 1838 39 account is very based on this persecution and it's when you start to hear all the creeds are an abomination whereas 1832 was much more your sins were your were forgiven right is it possible like that a memory becomes so distorted let's say and i'm not revealing my personal viewpoints sure. here, but um, that there's a new section yeah. that was that was not in the objective reality. The, sure. the creeds the creeds were not an, an abomination truly in 1832 or in 1820 the objective mm-hmm. version, mm-hmm. but in 1838 Joseph had somehow become convinced. Is that a possibility? In your it's mind? definitely a possibility, but you shouldn't trust me or anyone else to tell you how much it happened because we have no way of knowing. Yeah. Yeah. I have no way of telling how much distortion there is because I don't have uh, a perfect, I don't have an urtext 
mm-hmm. uh, from the beginning to compare everything else to. And I'm not even sure it would work that way at all. In other words, there's not a don't, don't assume that uh, you're kind of going to um, your memories are going to get worse and worse over time. Um, I think there's all kinds of reasons to think of each one of the accounts as its own creation without a whole lot of relationship to the others, right? I've been pushing Ann Taves and, and uh, others on this point, and it's a robust and really wonderful discussion. They've been pushing me too, and Ann has on, on thinking about these things uh, very carefully and, and consciously. And I think uh, we could defend the point pretty well from the science of memory that there is no reason to assume that the memories become increasingly distorted over time. Mm. So you'll notice that what I do in the book is take each one of them on their own merits, yeah. mm-hmm. right? So you, you raise the question, does the climate of persecution at the time of the 1838-39 memory distort it so much that it's not real reliable? Possibly. But the other possibility is also there or a whole range of possibilities in other words i'm not sure that it's not that that doesn't capture best what was happening at the time of the vision joseph thought so right of all the ones he decides to feature and choose and that the church has chosen over time that's the one and it may be because it situates us um relative to the rest of christianity right we our genesis is as um, you know, we access God directly, yeah. and with yeah. no help from the Protestant clergy, we turn to them first, and all we got were a conflict of opinions, war of words, mm-hmm. right? Uh, all that led to was confusion, as Joseph yeah. says. So we had to go to the Bible and to James one and five. The Bible yeah. turned out not to be all sufficient and alone sufficient by itself. We required new revelation. So some some very basic things about the restored gospel yeah. are embedded in that account. And, you know, is that what's cause and what's effect? I don't know. Yeah. I can't tell. But that was such an interesting message of the book. I thought that there's so much to be learned about ourselves by what was selected and repeated, yes. e- maybe more so than what actually happened. Like, let's just look at what we picked right. to pass on and what he picked to pass on. I wonder very much if our... um persecution complex i don't think that's an overstatement sometimes yeah. it's it's more intense than others i wonder if that doesn't all uh go back to the missouri right yeah. Yeah. and remembering the the very first vision in light of missouri seems to be right. what gives us that yeah. sense of yeah. the persecuted people yeah, yeah, it's it, really it's a, an important theme of the book that memory consolidates not just individually but collectively, collectively as well. And it was fascinating to me when you brought up the fact that you know a lot of people have this um, uh, this image of Joseph going back to his home and telling his mother mm-hmm. about the vision. I feel like I have that memory, you know, and I don't know where it, <laughs> yeah. I don't know where it came yeah. from, but somehow it consolidated movies. culturally. Movies, yeah, yeah, it's probably movies, right? I don't know which ones. But like I can picture that mm-hmm. literally in my mind, and that means that somehow th- that memory, which appears now to be inaccurate, um, w- had consolidated for me. So maybe could you talk about how um, the process of, as you put it in the book, selection, relation, repeating yeah. uh, takes place, and and culturally how memory how memory forms? Sure, it, it may uh, surprise us to learn that. It's by no means uh, certain that mm. Latter Day Saints would remember that Joseph Smith had a first vision, yeah, yeah. because he was reluctant, early yeah, yeah, early or or now, yeah. right? It's a lot of contingent choices, yeah, any one of which is made in a different direction, and you and I might not be sitting here talking yeah. about a book and the two hundred two hundredth uh, anniversary of the first vision, <laughs> yeah. So first of all, Joseph is reluctant to tell the story. And he's reluctant to write it. And it was by no means a, a foregone conclusion that he would. Yeah. And when he did, it's by no means, you know, determined exactly how he'll tell the story, mm-hmm. uh, how it'll get recorded. And once it's recorded, it's by no means certain that it will become common knowledge of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. I've talked about this to a lot of audiences uh, in these early months of eight, of uh, ni- of 2020, and there are 
lots of people who are astonished when I tell them the early missionaries did not preach the first vision. Yeah. They probably did not know it. Yeah. Now, that just seems completely unthinkable because right. today we almost start with the first vision. Yeah. Uh, if not for Orson Pratt, then we probably would not tell the story of the first vision the way we do. He's the only one in the middle decades of the 19th century who was telling the story the way Joseph had told it mm -hmm. in his manuscript history. And then Frank, uh, Franklin Richards, the young apostle called to lead the British mission, puts that in the Pearl of Great Price, which initially yeah. is just a pamphlet, right, for just for studying uh, among British converts. And then it's 30 years later that the Pearl of Great Price becomes canon, uh, becomes yeah. a standard work. And if that doesn't happen, I'm not sure we're sitting here having this yeah. conversation. Yeah. I remember you bringing up in the book that even Brigham Young, as president of the church, and John Taylor, prior to being president of the church, were related. They were making similar conflations that Oliver Cowdery did. Yes, they were not so. talking about this in a coherent way, really. In not the, the way we do today. Yeah, and George A. Smith as well. George A. Smith, when he was the church historian in the 50s and 60s, yeah. uh, telling it in a way that would be incoherent to today's uh, Latter Day Saints. That's fascinating. Okay, so it's obvious now that our foundational seminal story really has become the first vision. Mm -hmm. um, it, in, when I was in the MTC, we learned to pray in Spanish first, and then we memorized the first vision in Spanish. And in the, our first lesson, it was very foundational doctrines. You know, Heavenly Father exists and loves you. Christ is the Savior. And then we would jump pretty much into the Joseph Smith story and right. recite word for word in Spanish, in my case, the 1838-39 uh, vision. Um, missionary work obviously looked very different in the 1832, let's call it 1880 era, where that memory had not been consolidated as the right. seminal story of the church. But do you have an idea of what the narrative arc was for missionaries when they went out and preached the gospel? Was it yeah. Moroni and the gold plates? or I wrote yeah. my master's thesis on what missionaries taught in the first oh, wow. decade. Oh, wow. And I, I surveyed uh, at least 100 missionary journals and then all the periodicals from the 1830s and letters, uh, autobiographies, none of them, none of them mentioned teaching the first vision. Wow. wow. In fact, if you said the vision in the 1830s, you meant the DNC 76. You meant the vision of the oh, heavenly glories. Really? Yeah. Not until 1849 in the historical record do we have the pair of words together, first, first vision. vision. And it's Orson Pratt who seems to have been the first to coin that term. Wow. Wow. So what did they teach? They taught the covenant God made with his people anciently is broken, as the Bible prophesies, and it needs to be restored. And the good news is it has been. And the way we know that is God called a young man in New York to translate this book by the power of God. Here it is. Here's the book. So they would start with wow. biblical passages about the broken covenant, the gathering and scattering of Israel, yeah. the restoration of the covenant in the latter days. And then they wouldn't so much preach from the Book of Mormon as they would use it as the evidence that the covenant had been renewed. Wow. It was compelling. That's amazing. That is so interesting. For biblically literate folks like they were preaching to, it was a compelling message. Yeah. And I guess that was their target audience primarily Absolutely. was very biblically literate. Yeah, yeah very much so. These, these people know the Bible better typically than we do today and they understand these prophecies many of them are looking for some some restoration or renewal of the covenant all right they know that it's broken they know that christianity is broken in some mm -hmm. way or other and they're mm -hmm. looking for something so when the missionaries bring them the book of mormon that's a compelling yeah. piece of evidence and they get to digest it for themselves they get to think about the implications of this book. It means God has called a new servant, a new prophet. It means yeah. the covenant has been renewed. Uh, the, the Book of Mormon is compelling as restoration of the covenant. It says it's, it will be in the book yeah. itself, and that's what the missionaries preached very what were successfully. The, what were the <laughs> specifics of the covenant being renewed? Were they talking about priesthood restoration there? Or? Some of them were. Parley Pratt used those terms. Uh, Edward Partridge did. So some people were explicitly looking for a, a new apostle to come, somebody called mm. of God and, and authorized by God. So that was, uh, uh, yes, that was a key component of it. Not everybody used those terms, but yeah. many did. 
why do you think it shifted? I mean, you talk about that it for a memory to survive, it has mm -hmm. to be selected and then related and repeated. repeated. And we know we see Orson Pratt, you know, marching around just repeating, <laughs> repeating, repeating, and it was growing. But what do you think was so meaningful about that message that made it stick? Which message the, now? The that, first vision. It's shifting from this yeah. idea that we're I mean, and that and that message of course is still there, but it doesn't seem like the hook right. you know, anymore. How did it how did it change to become so much uh, about God speaking to people? It's a great question. Uh, John A. Widso said he was speaking to the uh, to the Latter day Saint students at Utah State mid twentieth century, early twentieth century, and he said he told them his conversion story. And he told them Joseph's, he told mm -hmm. the first vision. And he said that first vision is the epitome of the search for all truth. Wow. So I think there's something in that about it. Joseph Smith's quest for God is a very useful way to explain how all of us can come to know for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you lack wisdom, ask God. Yeah. Right. Um, his search for truth is the epitome. Yeah. And I think it's that as much as any other single factor that makes it resonate. Mm. And we don't want to we don't want to say that it didn't resonate that way early on. I don't mm. want to give that impression, but it definitely has gained momentum. Yeah. Over time. And I don't know if the, there's ever been more momentum than there is right now. Yeah. yeah. For that message. Yeah. 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 We, we were talking. It was so interesting to hear about the centennial celebration of the first vision. And we're we're preparing and 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 we're going to have this second, this big bicentennial. And, and it, it's such a reflection of what we did 100 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's the same. We're, we're singing songs and writing poems and, and reading about it and talking about it. Artwork. And yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting to see the way that we are repeating this right. message in, in exactly the, the same way. You know, it, it's, it's retained all of that meaning. Indeed. And, and maybe gain momentum, like you said. Yeah, I think so. And there's been some interesting shifts, too. We uh, Around the turn of the century, B.H. Uh, Roberts had a debate with a Catholic priest from um, southern Idaho, and and uh, it turned on part of, it, part of it on the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And B.H. Roberts evoked the first vision to emphasize the nature of God and Christ yeah. as separate and distinct. Body. And and that became a real point of interest uh, all the way wow. back in 1849 orson pratt had used the first vision to make that point as well there's some evidence that it was used for that in the 30s and 40s 1830s and wow. 40s but it definitely in my lifetime it seemed like the most important thing about the first vision is it showed that the trinity was was wrong yeah and it's still being used that way but i detect uh, a shift to much more emphasis on the thing about the first vision it shows that god loves us mm. It shows that he's responsive to our needs and our, our, you know, Joseph uses the word anxiety a lot. And that's a big yeah. deal today. He's yeah. confused. He's perplexed. He's distressed. He's convicted of his sins. And God is loving yeah. and comes to his aid. Terrell Givens gave a great talk at BYU years ago where he told the story of Sarah Edwards, the wife of Reverend Jonathan Edwards, one of the foremost preachers in American history. Mm -hmm. And he juxtaposed... Uh, Edwards is sinners in the hands of an angry God, where he says, mm. God abhors you yeah. with Sarah's personal um, witness, this, this revelation she has that God is loving, mm. kind, long-suffering, etc. Yeah. And uh, the conclusion of this, Terrell says, you know, uh, Sarah, the first vision is Sarah's answer, as wow. well as Joseph's, and thousands of millions of people. So there's resonance in the first vision for all of us who want to know if God loves us or hates us, if we're already damned and there's nothing we can do about yeah. it, or if we can come unto him and and um, receive his grace and his yeah. love. It, it, it Joseph's story becomes everyone's story yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about in the book how uh, there the first vision became sort of a new identity marker too for the church as polygamy was sort of forced Definitely. forced out. And obviously I'm not coming from a historian's perspective at all, but based on what I understood from the book, it seemed like Mormonism and plural marriage had sort of become wrapped up in this. And the, the, the plural marriage itself had become very much the identity of, right. of mm -hmm. the saints. And when that was forced out, it, there was this sense like, who, who are we? And there was sort of a doubling down on the story of the first vision. And, um, 
and that was embraced Indeed. E- even further be- because the because there was this lack of identity. Yeah, that's Kathleen Flake's argument. Mm-hmm. I didn't invent that argument. She's the one who discovered and articulated that set of facts. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a brilliant piece of work. Uh, what I did is just sort of extended it a little bit. She she noticed that it was Joseph F. Smith who was the main driver of that shift. Hmm. Uh, he had a difficult dilemma. How yeah. do we let go of Joseph Smith's last revelation without sending the message that we're letting go of Joseph Smith as a revelator? Yeah. Yeah. And Joseph F. Smith comes to the conclusion the way we do that is we emphasize Joseph Smith's first revelation. Interesting. Yeah. And he did. He was very determined in his efforts. He would go around to congregations and often invite a 14-year-old young man to stand next to him, and he would emphasize this yeah. is the age of Joseph at the vision. He would tell the story of the vision. Yeah. He made a real point of shifting the emphasis to Joseph's first revelation and away from his last. Yeah. And he steered the saints, I believe, brilliantly uh, through a very difficult passage of renegotiating our identity Mm -hmm. and what Kathleen Flake calls replacing memory, which he did Mm -hmm. quite brilliantly. So I'm kind of on that note. I've been thinking a lot about how consolidation looks now in this era where there is so much information, you know, it made more sense that like, I feel like Orson Pratt just really had so much power because mm-hmm. there just wasn't any other information. He was just, he could say, he could tell the story the way he wanted to. And he, that was the only, that was the only information that you had. And now we ha- just have a sea of information and it feels like an Orson Pratt would be completely lost in all of these other voices. So how does, yeah. how does consolidation work now that you have access to anything you want? So if I had my way, I would, um, encourage the church to write a new narrative history and give it the stamp of approval and circulate it far and wide. I'd send it in 14 languages to 98% of Latter-day Saints on the planet. That's very specific. Indeed. (laughs) So you can tell that I'm hinting at saints, uh, the church's Mm -hmm. new multi-volume history, which starts off with uh, a volcanic explosion in Indonesia, hopefully begging the question, what? Yeah. Does this have to do with church history and begging the question of the problem of suffering? Mm. And uh, hopefully then indicating to people, if you keep reading, maybe you'll find an answer to that. Mm. And as they keep reading, it tells the story of Joseph's first vision in a way that integrates the accounts that we have and that is responsible historically mm. and resilient, more resilient than anything we've published before. Um, yeah about the first vision we've also got a new movie that plays in the church history museum and it starts Mm -hmm. off by saying there are nine accounts of the first vision yeah and this is what they say and then you watch the film and then you leave the theater and right outside the door you see facsimiles of all the accounts with the passages that are in the movie highlighted that kind of transparency is unheard of yeah. In the past, the way we've done it, uh, the, the textbook we used to use for Religion 341 at BYU drew on the accounts, but it didn't tell anybody that it did. Yeah. So people don't know. Right? Yeah. Jeremy Runnels in the CES letter in 2013 says, I never knew. Yeah. Or, and he could have taken that class, done yeah. all the reading dutifully, mm-hmm. and still had no idea there mm-hmm. are multiple accounts, which opens people up to being blindsided. Why didn't the church tell me this? Yeah. So that is going to go away. Yeah. Um, and I, if I could do anything, I would trumpet the story of the first vision, yeah. uh, the, way, um, the way we've been telling it. This mm-hmm. is evidence that God loves you. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't abhor you. He loves you. Yeah. He'll be responsive to you. And I would uh, make that everyone's story, and I would make their faith less resilient to attacks. More uh, resilient. Yeah. 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 More resilient. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, scrap that. <laughs> um, so when Aubrey says, like, there's so much information, you can find it anywhere, you're making the argument that the church itself still does have significant power as a re- selector and repeater of memory. The church is still the most significant selector and relator. It, it's sort of, in my judgment, it sort of gave that ground for a while, right? Yeah. Uh, and every, with the information age, everybody becomes a selector and yeah. relator. 
And so the church is in a more competitive space now for the attention. And it can't take for granted that everybody's going to come to Sunday school to get their story of the first vision. Yeah. And so it's been more um, proactive, more interested in creative new ways of yeah. telling this story and definitely still though the most powerful selector and relator yeah i'm just curious um how explicit the goal was with saints you know i i feel conflicted because i i feel like there is a place for something to be faith promoting mm -hmm. and and i feel like that's what we've had for for you know in general conference for all of these years it's it's about promoting faith and i feel like there should be space for that it should be okay sure. to stand up and share the story of the first vision in an effort to promote faith without reading all nine accounts but but then I think that's why people feel very betrayed because that's all th yeah. they only ever heard the faith promotion. And so and so are we how do you find some kind of balance or is there not a place for balance? And saints is about accuracy. You talk a lot about how entities favor coherency over accuracy, right. which I, I can totally understand. But I think there is this cry for accuracy now. Sure. So how did you how did what, what is the objective of saints? Is it to is it for accuracy as close as we can get accuracy and what does that look like if you just can't have it you know you can't include everything right so how do you how do you decide if it's about faith or is it about oh uh, you try to have it both ways right? <laughs> yeah. can you yeah, can to... you do that can you do <laughs> sure. both yeah. sure so saints uh is the tip of the iceberg the the, the volumes themselves are the tip of the iceberg yeah. and then there are uh, footnotes to all the accounts mm. of the vision. There are supplemental essays and videos available a couple of clicks away. Yeah. So for anybody who wants to dig deeper, it's all there. But yeah. the narrative itself, as you can tell, uh, the folks who drafted it were well aware that we're aiming at the laity here. Yeah. We're not talking to the scholars or the few, the tiny number who are gonna dig deeper. This is our right. one shot. Yeah. To get people's attention. And if we can't keep their attention, yeah. we're dead. Yeah, you know? so it's got to be readable. It's got to be intensely readable. Yeah. And so it's very much a conscious narrative as a means to the end of keeping people reading. And okay. if they'll keep reading, their collective memory, their shared sense of knowledge and understanding of what it means to be a Latter-day Saint will be subtly formed yeah uh, consolidated yes yeah. yeah that's so interesting. interesting do you feel like there is a shift in 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 just a world view that people have a higher standard for accuracy now i mean do you think we're starting to favor accuracy over co coherency uh, i'm not sure as about opposed that. to the as opposed to the early days of yeah. the church i'm not sure about that i'm quite skeptical of anything that makes us feel like we're better than them <laughs> <laughs> right. This is what humans yeah. do. We yeah. we say, man, those ancestors of mine, yeah. they were dodos. But thankfully, I've seen yeah. the light. Yeah. And we do that with our various tribes that we belong to here and now. Yeah. So anything where we uh, where the explanation tends to favor me here now mm -hmm. is suspicious to me. Mm -hmm. I think it's human nature to favor a coherent story. Mm -hmm. over a particularly accurate one. I, you know, when you earn a PhD in history, you spend a lot of time studying different historiographical schools of thought. Mm -hmm. And there's always one to replace the one before it. Yeah. I'm, I've done that enough to think that I'm not sure the new one is now yeah. accurate and the old one wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's just another way to be coherent with the, the values that yeah. we've got right now. Yeah. So... I'm not positive we're we're gonna make you know the fine jump the final hurdle to be accurate now. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm I, we worked awfully hard to help yeah. saints be accurate historically, but I I'm not um, I don't think it's gonna sort of magically cure all of our innate human desire to have a story that's coherent. Yeah. And I'm yeah, not that sure that's sense. wrong, right? Yeah. Coherence and truth are not incompatible. I'm not using those as right. yeah. as okay, opposites yeah. of each other. There's a kind of, when I taught the, the New Testament Gospels at uh, BYU Jerusalem Center, I would emphasize to the students, you've got to, you've got to open your mind to the idea of sort of things being literarily true, mm -hmm. not just historically true. 
Right? The Gospel of John and the Synoptic Gospels cannot both be true in the same sense. They tell yeah. different stories. Right. Um, so which one's true? Well, both are true. If we can expand our sense of truth to, to en- encompass what John's doing. John's telling a true story. Yeah. I'm not positive he gets the date of the Passover right. Yeah. I'm not right. positive the others do. Uh, but they're true. Yeah. And so in that sense, uh, we're telling a true story. Uh, our, our way of thinking about historical truth in the 20th, 21st century, since the Enlightenment really, mm-hmm. is much more rigid than ancient mm. notions were. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. And maybe then human nature is as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's really interesting. I, I, this gets at a, an extremely important point: this sort of subjective versus objective view of history. And I think mm-hmm. what we skipped over sort of an important ninety years, you know, talking about the original consolidation yeah. all the way up, in, up up till saints. And the, that time was when the first vision first came under attack, indeed, really historically under serious attack. So maybe we could could we talk a little you bit bet. about what those original attacks were, why they came about, and how that how that mm-hmm. developed into the new sort of narrative that we're developing now yeah yeah sure let's kind of run through time the, the first one is you know the minister saying son there are yeah. no more visions <laughs> yeah today. that was <laughs> the of the devil first. yeah keep your mouth shut about that uh, and then you know we go a good long time the next one that comes along in some ways is the sophisticated professorial critique late 19th and early 20th century this is where um, people uh, are not, I Woodbridge, Riley, uh, others are not necessarily, um, they're not the Methodist minister who's in competition with, yeah. you know, potentially with a, a young visionary. They're just uh, interested in academic uh, understanding and they uh, favor naturalistic explanations for stories like Joseph's. They don't mm-hmm. believe in the supernatural. So clearly, his explanation can't be the right one. So what would be a naturalistic way to explain Joseph's experience? So that's yeah. the next one that comes along. Uh, Jamesian pragmatism, uh, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that starts to gain hold at BYU. Yeah, right? it, it comes in to BYU in the early 20th century. And uh, the church, the board of trustees sends a, uh, you know, a trusted person down to figure out what's going on down there. And he reports... You got professors down there who are teaching that the first vision was not a real historical event, just kind of in Joseph's imagination. And mm-hmm. and those professors are um, invited to change what they're teaching or withdraw. Some of them resign. Some of them don't have their contracts renewed. Um, mm-hmm. Then the next thing that come along is Fawn Brody. And she writes a very potent biography of Joseph in the mid-40s. And she um, articulates uh, an interpretation of the first vision that uh, Dale Morgan has researched. Uh, I hope people will learn more about Dale Morgan and Fawn Brody in the book, both very Mm -hmm. interesting uh, major players in this. And Morgan hasn't been able to get his, and hasn't really tried to get his stuff to a wide audience, but by Fawn Brody's book, it does. And essentially it's a source critique of the vision. It says... Since there's no account of it until quite late, Mm -hmm. the explanation is that Joseph is raised in a revival culture. He's got evangelical angst. Yeah. uh, But really, there's no vision in 1820. He makes that up when he needs uh, credibility. Yeah. I don't, this is, this uh, interpretation sort of falls apart before Fawn Brody herself because over time, more accounts of the vision come to light. And they move the vision back in time. You know, at least Joseph had to have come up with it by the early 1830s. Right. She yeah. just moves her date back. So it kind of falls apart. But she does observe then, well, the more accounts you have, the more evidence there is for embellishment. He's spinning mm-hmm. this story and it gets bigger and better all the time. So those mm-hmm. those two, um, you know, uh, points become compelling to a lot yeah. of people. Uh, undermines the first vision for some people. And then, in my judgment, by far the most um, sophisticated and interesting critique of the vision comes from the Reverend Wesley Walters. Yeah. And his story is terrific. I hope people will 
learn a lot about him in the book. I knew about Reverend Walters before I started researching and writing the book, but I read all of his papers at um, wow. the Presbyterian Archives in St. Louis and had a, I have a love-hate relationship with the <laughs> Reverend Walters. Uh, my admiration for him grew as I yeah. studied his papers. Um, Could you I'd tell like his story briefly? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, like so, so the whole story is he's, he's, he's raised as an evangelical but doesn't have his own conversion experience. So he's sure as a teenager, he's damned. He's going to hell. And then he hears uh, in Baltimore, he hears the Reverend Donald Barnhouse preach Christ. And it's a beautiful sermon that convinces Walters that he is redeemable, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's been saved by Jesus Christ. So this is an evangelical conversion. And it means everything to him, everything. So his experience, conversion to Presbyterianism, is on the line, right? When, yeah. he re when he reads Joseph Smith's first vision and Joseph says, Mom, I just learned for myself Presbyterianism isn't true. Well, if you're Reverend Walters, you got to fight that and defend it. He goes on to become a Presbyter seminary trained Presbyterian minister. He's a pastor of a church in Marissa, Illinois. And... Um, he doesn't really have plans to do a lot of research and writing about uh, the restored gospel, but um, he gets invited to contribute an essay to Christianity Today, and he decides to do that. And that's the beginning. And then over time, he digs deeper and deeper into the first vision. And he comes up with a novel thesis. It is that uh, you cannot prove or disprove a heavenly vision. He doesn't want to go naturalistic right yeah. he, he definitely wants to defend biblical miracles right so he doesn't want to say there's no such thing as visions he says there there's no way to prove or disprove vision but joseph smith tells us some verifiable historical details and we could prove or disprove those for yeah. example there's an unusual excitement on the subject of religion in his vicinity sometime very soon before the first vision and Reverend Walters digs up a whole bunch of evidence that he believes disproves that point, and therefore there's no vision. Yeah, It seemed like a pretty robust argument. It still is widely circulated. It's much, much weaker than Walters uh, hoped or thought. Uh, a couple of fallacious arguments embedded in it. One is that he, he locks Joseph up too much in space, right? Joseph mm. uh, is not talking about Palmyra Village. That was the yeah. location of Walter's research. Joseph's talking about the whole district of country, a Methodist term for mm -hmm. the whole area around him. Uh, and um, um, it's an irrelevant proof as well, showing that there's no evidence of revival in Palmyra Village is not showing that a vision didn't happen in the woods yeah. in mm -hmm. Manchester. So Milton Backman and others uh, went to work, uh, young Latter-day Saint historians, Ivy League educated, mm -hmm. they went to work after Walters published his piece in 1967, and they they chipped away at it pretty good. And then most influentially, he and Richard Bushman, Reverend Walters and Richard Bushman went back and forth. Yeah, I in, love um, this. In, um, in the late 1960s and argued the case there. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about their exchange is that the way you put it, I think Reverend Walters has what we might call an objective view of history. Right. He believes that we can evaluate objectively what happened. And Richard Bushman sort of brings this uh, this perspective that history from our, from our perspective has to be subjective because there are our sources the only lens through which we can view history are subjective. It's right. it's always through people. And I felt like that was um, maybe the crux of what uh, of re what Richard Bushman both argued to Reverend Walters and his uh, historical work that he was going to do in, in coming decades. Right. I don't know if you could share some thoughts on the nature of subjective versus objective history and where we are today and the way that we the way that we, think, that we approach that. Yeah, you know, that's you've characterized it really well. And what I say in the book is that even though Bushman makes a counter argument where he says, Reverend, you keep saying you keep saying the religious excitement wasn't big enough or yeah. broad enough or exciting enough. Bushman says, how big is big? Yeah. Yeah. How, how you are you are trying to say there's an objective measure right. to what Joseph subjectively remembers as a religious excitement that got my attention and made yeah. me concerned. And 
Bushman says this stuff's happening internal to Joseph right. forever, and yeah. you can't you can't pretend that there's sort of a threshold at which it becomes an unusual religious right. excitement. Right. So um, terrific arguments, but the point I make in the book is that at the time, probably most Latter Day Saints think the same way Reverend Walters thinks. He's yeah. a conservative evangelical. He thinks about his scriptures, his Bible, as pretty much, you know, um, unassailable, right? Yeah. He does not like source criticism of the Bible. He doesn't like the idea of subjective judgments and uh, thinking of history as a subjective recreation of the past. He thinks it can be yeah. objectively done. And so, uh, ironically then, it's Reverend Walters who makes a case that's most similar to the way Latter-day Saints at the time tended to think about the vision themselves. And it's Richard yeah. Bushman who makes a case that saves the vision but introduces some elements that would make some Latter-day Saints uncomfortable. And to give away the end of the story, the story of the last half century is that Richard Bushman's way of characterizing and interpreting the vision has become the way that is presented in Saints mm, yeah. And and elsewhere in the in the first vision accounts essay, yeah, it's been an interesting half century. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I I, I we loved Rough Stone Rolling, and I think that maybe was why it, it, it he really he started the book with this with explaining that it is subjective and like that's as close to the truth as we can get, yeah. and that's okay. You know, we're not we're not digging for the the perfect uninfluenced objective truth yeah. because it just that's Doesn't not exist. history yeah we can pretend it does we can tell ourselves it does but yeah. historians don't deal that's in when it gets problematic yeah. Yeah. yeah we yeah. deal in human yeah human understandings yeah yes. human subjectivity yeah we've yeah, seen we've seen recently that even like emails that we're getting in the past you know a few weeks and months as we've been talking more about the first vision or as we've been researching this a lot of the sort of more apologetic approach is to attempt to reconcile each of the first visions mm. for, excuse me, mm. first vision accounts and show how they're all objectively true. And I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but it seems to me like you could make the argument that they're all, they're all distorted. So there's no, there's no yeah. real uh, meat behind yeah. trying to say these describe the exact same thing because they don't, they're all subjective in their own way. They've all been presented to, to different audiences under different circumstances. Right. Like you, yeah. you've made that point. And so, I, I, and I'm personally a little bit more comfortable with that approach. I would say it this way. Uh, which account of the first vision is true? They're all true. Yeah. Yeah. Which one's distorted? They're, They're all, all distorted. distorted. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, autobiographical memories aren't true or false. Yeah. They're true and false. Yeah. They're not um, accurate or inaccurate. They're yeah. both. Yeah. And if you read them carefully, you can even see that in them. Yeah. Right. Some things are so specific, so vivid. And then other things are fuzzy around the edges and yeah. vague and, and um, you know, uh, and then then they, they change over time in interesting ways. The, the 1838 account, the one that is so intense, mm -hmm. I had seen a vision. I knew it. I knew God knew it. I could not deny it. Mm -hmm. that, that is a big chunk of interpretive memory. Yeah. That's not about the facts of what happened in the grove. Yeah. That that's you know that goes that factual memory goes along until Joseph says a few days after I told the Methodist minister I was rejected, that launches into a period a, a, a passage of interpretive memory. It's all about how I've been thinking of it then and since. Yeah. He says, mm -hmm. I have often thought it seemed like this. It felt yeah. like that. Yeah. That's a piece of reflection that is specific to that moment right that particular past in that particular present right. gives us that reflection yeah and one of the most interesting things is that a couple of years later when joseph redrafts uh this document that's relatively new to us this yeah uh, howard corey uh fair copy we call it joseph cuts out almost all of that yeah that part yeah. Uh, the the in, the subjective feeling of what it was like to to experience the vision in the context of Missouri persecution. The present moment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, you um you talk near the end of the book about how Gordon B Hinckley made a statement I think in 2002 2002, 2002 that sort of like our entire 
religion, mm-hmm. I can't, I'm going I'm to slaughter it, but in some sense, he says, lives or dies on the absolute truth or, or right. falsehood of this, right. of this vision. Um, is that is that a view that you think is uh, sustainable for a uh, for a person of faith in these? And ironically, you, I yeah. think you mentioned too that Jeremy Runnels quotes that right. statement in the CES letter. Yeah, because he's going to set it up and say if it's not absolutely true, <laughs> then it must be absolutely false. Then it's all false. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie made a similar statement in 1958, and so uh, Wesley Walters evoked that. Right. Yeah. Um, Gerald and Sandra Tanner have done the same thing. It's a strategy that antagonists uh, will use when when we make an ultimatum or an all or yeah. nothing, then they say, great, uh, we'll, we'll tip that over and then you'll be done. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't quite work that way. I want to be crystal clear here. I love Joseph Smith's first vision. I mean, I think that's obvious. Mm-hmm. I believe it is a historical event. I don't, um, I love it. I love mm-hmm. everything it says about the nature of God and Christ and teenagers mm-hmm. who need help from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and this book that we're talking about, is not really about that. It's not about what I think about it, uh, spiritually yeah. myself. It's about what everybody has thought about it over time. So I represent all kinds of views. And one of the stories that the book tells is how the stakes have been raised, how mm-hmm. the first vision has become all or nothing. Yeah. Right. Um, in 1938, J. Reuben Clark, a member of the first presidency, uh, says, to the church's educators, right? The religion teachers, look, if you don't believe in the historical reality of the first vision, you're not fit to be a church educator. Yeah. And that's not a, a, I'm perfectly fine with that, right? I, I feel that way myself. But if you had made that rule in 1840, it wouldn't have worked. Interesting. Yeah. Right? So, so in other words, there's been that. change over time. Yeah. I'm not saying the change is wrong or bad. But I am saying that the stakes on the first vision have definitely been raised yeah. mm. to be all or nothing. I'd be okay. I can conceive of, um, let's say Joseph decided never to record it. Mm-hmm. And so it happened, but you and I don't know about it. I don't think the restored church of Jesus Christ would go away or falter or crumble. I think we'd still be founded on the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd be okay. All the stuff we've got to have, all the essential stuff we'd still have. So I'm not uh, quite as worried about that, but I am very fascinated by the story of raising stakes of the vision. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting battle. The battle lines have been drawn on that. I'm curious if you have sort of pragmatic advice as we, I think, draw near to the close of this discussion for, um, for a thoughtful member who's struggled with uh, faith and maybe some of their uh, struggles have centered around the first vision. Mm-hmm. You know, there is this feeling of uh, betrayal, but even potentially if you've, uh, you you felt like, you know, it was disingenuous what you right. what you heard growing up. But even once you move past that, uh, you know, I think a reasonable person could look at all the different accounts and have trouble tr- trying to reconcile them enough to say there's mm-hmm. objective truth behind it. Mm-hmm. And so do you have do you have advice for someone who's looking to reconcile or who's looking to regain faith or to or even not necessarily to convince themselves of um of a particular truth but to find a place that's that's comfortable for them yeah sure boy we could go on yeah right um (laughs) we'll start a new episode right yeah (laughs) so one thing that is common in situations like this is that people are making assumptions that they don't know are assumptions Mm. And if, if your assumption gets overturned and you assumed it was, you know, the bedrock of your faith, or even if it was the bedrock of your faith, then that's, that's a, that leads to trouble, disruption yeah. of your memory. Yeah. Um, and that's when you, that's not the only explanation for these cases, but that's a common one. So one good thing to do is to ask yourself, what do I know and how do I know it? Evaluate your uh, epistemology, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Figure out, I mean, peel back all the layers. What yeah. do I know and how do I know it? It doesn't, um, I, I'm a little tired. This is uncharitable, perhaps. I don't mean for it to be, but <laughs> let's stop blaming the church, right? Mm. 
I don't know who we even mean when we say that. Do we mean the volunteer teachers who we thought maybe should know better, but nobody told them either? Mm-hmm. Um, let's be more charitable. I'm in being uncharitable. I'm asking for people to be more charitable yeah. toward people in the past mm. who did the best they could with what they had. So let me say it another way. I'll, I'll blame this on Dean Jesse, one of my heroes, mm. one of the great scholars of Joseph Smith and especially of his first vision accounts. A uh, decade or so ago, I asked Dean, what do you, why do you think I asked him the question you just asked? Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, perhaps if people were more inclined to read. Mm. And what he meant by that is the vision accounts have been published for 50 years. The true, they haven't been shouted from the housetops, but they've been available. Um, And some people feel resentful of that. You know, why didn't they, I remember reading, and there's actually a comment in the book from a person saying, why don't we talk about this in general I didn't know to ask. I I didn't know it was there. Right. So I'd like... For, I wish everybody had the privileges I've had. I mm. studied the first vision accounts from Milton Backman, the guy who wrote the book on it, literally yeah. about the year I was born. Mm. <laughs> so it's not that they've been under a bushel exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, some of us didn't have that problem because we were taught all about them in the context of faith and uh, intellectual rigor. I just wish everybody could have that privilege yeah. and that blessing. Yeah. So I guess I'm dancing in circles here, not really answering the question. There's no one simple good answer to it. But it, I hope people know it's going to be okay. Yeah. Lots of people have had this challenge, this disruption to their faith. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's not the end. That's not. Yeah. It doesn't lead inevitably to hopelessness or despair or, or giving away everything that I cherished. Yeah. Um, Bruce and Marie Hafen have written beautifully about it. Their website is a terrific resource. Mm-hmm. Uh, faithisnotblind.org, I think it is. What you guys mm-hmm. are doing is fantastic. I appreciate Thank it very you. much. Yeah. Well, I wish I, I had a better answer. No, that's a great answer. And I, I think that it's, I think that we're seeing that the church is making such an effort to make it easier to find. You know, you don't have to really mm-hmm. dig anymore. It's just, it is all there. So when those, those questions come up, it'll be easier to have access. And I think yeah. it, toward the end of the book, you mentioned that the thing that's so incredible about memory is maybe not how quickly things are consolidated, but how quickly we forget that it was ever consolidated differently. And mm-hmm. I hope that is maybe what's changing, that pretty soon we'll move on from this idea that there was one only one story you know only one way to consolidate and now we have all of just so much access that's so easy and and maybe that will kind of that will change our story a little bit we are resilient we are more resilient than we might think yeah yeah and i know it's common to think oh my gosh oh my gosh the sky is falling and yeah Yeah. never done this before sometimes people uh can benefit from Remembering 1837, right? Yeah. That was a crisis. Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, for individuals, definitely, uh, and families, can be devastating. But uh, the church is resilient. Mm-hmm. The church will roll forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, many, many, many millions of people will be blessed by it. There will be struggles along the way. I mean, this is not unexpected stuff. This what, Everything we're going through. It's not unusual. Mm-hmm. It's not unexpected, and it's not uh, the end. It's yeah. not yeah. hopeless by yeah. any stretch. Yeah. So, and yeah. I think. Oh, sorry. And I, I, I really do believe that Widsow had a point, right? Joseph Smith's quest is an mm-hmm. epitome of the search for truth. We can all do what he did. Yeah. And some viewers and listeners will say, "Oh, that's so cliche. That's so." I know I can predict the, the comments now, but. F- but yeah. it's true. It really is true that if we work really hard at Joseph Smith did not just pray about it, right? That four word summary that oversimplifies the wrestle, mm-hmm. rather yeah. his own accounts and the scriptures he gives to us, they talk about wrestling yeah. before God and wrestling with God. And that stuff really is true. It does pay off. Yeah, It leads us yeah. to a better, better place. And Thank like, you. what a beautiful message that whether or not you feel like you can ever come to some sort of knowledge about whether it happened or not. Like I, I love just that, that we can value that, that this idea that 
wrestling is okay and important and that we should be doing that and that God can reach you. I, I mean, whether or not the first vision happened, like if that's the message of the first vision, then like, isn't that true? You know, that just the yeah. message, the truth and the truth in the way that you, that you described earlier in this very like whole way, you know, maybe not in a police report way. If you just can't ever yeah. get past that, we'll never have, we'll never, we'll never really be yeah. able to know that objectively. Then I think that there's some value in recognizing that there it's beautiful that we right. accept the wrestle and that that message has been so meaningful that it's lasted 200 years. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know the first vision was true objectively. I know it subjectively. Yeah. I know it yeah. in my own self. I don't yeah. know it because four You're out of five scientists approved it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's a great point. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done. I think this, um, you mentioned that you worked on saints for, 10 years? Well, sort of, um, yeah, six years full time, a few years before that part time. And you mentioned that this book, you started in 2008 and it was published end of last year. It's just a monumental effort. I think so many people are getting so much out of this. And like Aubrey said, like validating the wrestle that people have is is just huge. So thank you so much. And thanks for coming on this podcast. Thank you. It's really an honor to talk to you. Thanks for your great work. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And thanks again to Steve for coming and spending some time with us. If this conversation interests you, make sure to check out his book, First Vision, Memory, and Mormon Origins at Amazon or Desert Books website. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a rating or a thumbs up. Sending love and help to each of you. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.